Welcome to Health Center. I'm Dr. Monica Sweeney, professor in the School of Public Health here at Downstate. Thank you for being with us. I'm very happy today to welcome our guest, Dr. Lori Hepner, who is a professor in the School of Public Health. And she has her DRPH. She is here to discuss a very important subject. Thank you for being here, Dr. Hepner. Thank you for having me. We can call each other by our names now, can't we? <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about obesity and your research on obesity. Can you tell us about obesity in children and what's been going on in the last few years? Yes, of course. Obesity has been on the rise in children. It's an epidemic. And uh, where we started to see the epidemic climb is around the 1970s. And today, the numbers are around 20% of the population of children aged 2 to 19 years of age could be classified as obese. The, the problem with children being obese is that we're, you think about the developmental origins of disease and how children come about to have a problem of obesity and increased adiposity or increased fat mass. And, and then what the later complications are in life from having obesity at a young age. You know, what I want you to do, because there are a lot of people that don't do well with 20%, um, would you describe 20% for all of the audience what that means? So if you had 100 children? One in five children could be classified as obese. Okay, one in five. That makes it, we all can understand that. Yeah. Now, by what measure are they obese? So in children, um, determining obesity is a little different from adults. In adults, you look straight at the body mass index, or the BMI, and that is just a, a, a fraction of looking at the weight over height. And mm -hmm. in children, it's actually look standardized against a, a population that the CDC had determined, uh, a nationwide sample. And in children, you're actually looking at something called a BMI percentile or a BMI, uh, a BMI Z score, which is what my research looked at, standardized, uh, a, a more standardized measure. So um, in children, classification of obesity is a BMI percentile of 95 or higher, 95th percentile or higher. And um, there's also uh, where you start to have a, a warning sign perhaps from a physician when the child is between 85th percentile and 95th percentile, they're considered overweight. So when most children go to their pediatrician, this is a standard measure that's done, is that correct? Yes, so it's basically, you're still just taking height and weight, which would happen at every physician visit, but they can graph it. There's a graph that's made from the CDC. It's based on, um, on sex of the child. There's a graph for girls and a graph for boys, and then they, they could plot it. Of course, computers today can do that for them, and it will, a computer would spit out a number for them. Um, I'm just gonna go back one uh, second to say, clinicians because I am physician oriented being one, but <clears throat> for our audience, you may go to some clinician that's not a physician and they do the same plotting for uh, measuring this very important piece of data. So now tell us a little bit about your research. Well, our research w was focused mostly or all on children who were either of African-American or Dominican descent and who lived in, the, in Northern Manhattan or the South Bronx and the mothers, their mothers were living there when they were pregnant with the children. And they were uh, collect, um, they were enrolled at the third trimester of pregnancy. So it's, it's a longitudinal study, meaning it's a birth cohort where the, the children have been being followed over time since 1998. And That's a very long study. It, it is. That's a very long they're, longitudinal they're very study. Very fortunate. For very good. So, um, and, uh, and many children have stayed in the study, many mothers have stayed in the study. So it's, it's a very rich source of information about the health of children from being in the womb. Um, so uh, the study that I was involved in was looking at exposures that the children have when they're pre prenatal in the womb, in utero, and what happens potentially if there's a relationship over time as the children get older. What is the relationship that you're looking at? Because in my community that I grew up in and that I spend a lot of time in, they say the child is just like the mother or just like the father, or <clears throat> they have, it's my genes 
everybody knows genes now. So what relationship were you looking at? I was looking at the relationship between exposures to bisphenol A, or BPA as it's commonly known, which is in a lot of different plastics and a lot of different consumer products that we come in contact with every day. So it would be no surprise that the mothers might have come in contact with that. And sure enough, we did find that maternal exposure uh, was around 92, 93% of mothers in the study have been exposed to bisphenol A while they were pregnant, which is similar to uh, national numbers uh, across the board. Uh, Why is this product important in terms of your study? What did you find in terms of a relationship between um, BPA and obesity? So we we found that, so the, okay, so, <laughs> So when I mentioned obesity and the, the classification of obesity for children, we're talking about BMI, the height and the weight, just straight height and weight <clears throat> measures. But what I was more interested in was actual measures of adiposity. In other words, the actual fat mass, the, the fat cells that are existing on the body versus just height and weight. Because height and weight um, is it's a quick and easy measure, but it doesn't tell you necessarily about what's on the body. It, it, um, for example, a classic example would be Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was Mr. Olympia in his heyday, all muscle, pure muscle, n no fat mass at all in his body probably. His classification would be obese because he weighed so much and because of his height. So it's, exactly. it's not necessarily uh, such a direct measure. It's a good indicator. So I was interested in actual adiposity measures and looking at, of course I looked at BMI itself, but I was looking more for these measures of uh, the, the tissue. Where? Where did you look for the tissue? Well, what parts of the body? So um, we were able to look at fat mass by using a, uh, a machine that, um, it's a bioimpedance machine that actually sends a little harmless electrical signal through the body. And it can detect all kinds of tissue in the body, fat mass, non-fat mass, water in the body, all sorts of things. So I looked at the, um, the fat mass that could be detected with this machine, but also waist circumference using a tape measure. Um, this is a really good way to determine whether or not there's um, adipose tissue being laid down around the waist. And this is a common area for where um, there will be development of, of this tissue. Well, <clears throat> the waist is, but I thought it was hip to waist ratio, or is that not in children? In children, it's very common to use waist circumference. And of course, when you are, are doing a study, um, you want to be able to compare your results to, to previous literature and, and see exactly. if there's uh, similarities, if there's a pattern, or if you're finding something different. Now, could you tell us what some of the products are that people are exposed to? First of all, did you measure this in the mother's or just children, the levels of, of um, biphenyl A? So we were interested in two things. Of course, we were interested in exposures in utero, and we were interested in exposures during childhood. So we looked at urine from the mothers during that was taken during the third trimester, one urine sample during third trimester. And we also looked at urines from the children during childhood, one sample at three years of age, five years of age, yes, three years of age, and five years of age. There's more. But that's what we were looking at um, in terms of um, uh, exposures um, in children. And um, what were, what are the products that we come in contact with that could expose us to uh, this chemical? So BPA is commonly used as a plastic hardener. So there are many plastic water bottles that are hard uh, com that likely, especially the older ones, contain BPA. And also it's used as a liner in cans, all kinds of food cans. So there's something called an epoxy resin and you, the BPA is a tiny little chemical. It's two little uh, rings of carbon with um, uh, hydroxyl groups hanging off of it. There, it's a tiny uh, chemical that th then can be combined, added together. And it makes an epoxy resin which can be used inside of a food can, uh, is it commonly used in food commonly cans? Commonly used in food cans, although some food companies are taking the BPA out and using different chemicals and, and stating that 
uh, as BPA free, but even uh, soda cans would have that. The interior lining of uh, milk cartons, if you ever notice that sort of like plastic, you can almost get it under your nail. Um, it's, it's BPA? Yes. Well, most likely it's an epoxy resin, so most likely BPA. As an environmentalist, as an expert in environmental, it looks like you have work to do, not only to find out uh, its significance, but then we have to have policies, which we can do together in the School of Public Health, to try and get these from this from being used if it turns out that this is a precursor to obesity. Yes, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt. And <laughs> is it boys and girls? Um, so in our study, the, the main findings looked at boys and girls together, and we found results that the bisphenol A uh, prenatally exposure, prenatally, not pr um, exposure during childhood, but exposure prenatally, was associated with an increase in the measures of adipose tissue. Um, and we then looked at them separately, looked at, um, it's called stratification, looking at girls versus boys, and only for one measure of, of adiposity, the, what is called the fat mass index, uh, which is very similar to the BMI. Instead of putting the weight o divided by height in meters squared, you would put the fat mass that you get from that machine um, divided by height. And we did see a significant difference between girls and boys. And um, so it's not a main finding, but it does hint that there, there could be a sex difference. Um, and and where that's important is that other studies have seen sex differences, but it's not necessarily across the board the same kind of sex difference at the same age. So it, you have more work to do on this. There's a lot more work to be done. So um, the thing that when you found these prenatal exposures and it seems to have an impact, what kinds of things would you tell? You just told us it's inside the lining of cans. Do we need to start looking at cans to see whether it says no B BPA, BPA free. free. Well, um, because the regulation is spotty on BPA and, and many companies are, are self-regulating and self-removing and putting in replacements, um, it, it's important to be aware. I, I really um, believe in awareness of the environment and products and chemicals and products. Um, however, there is concern that the replacements such as BPS and BPF um, are, are not any necessarily any better because they look, the chemical looks just like BPA and may act just like BPA. So what's more important is to try to eat healthy in terms of eating fresh fruits and vegetables that are not coming in contact with these sorts of linings, um, trying to use um, containers for water or beverage consumption that are not using plastic, so stainless steel or glass. Um, trying to find other ways than using plastic. And in addition, um, keeping pla if you are using plastic, to keep it away from uh, sources of friction, sources of heat extremes, or I'm sorry, temperature extremes. So heat, high heat or high cold, and not freezing our water bottles, not putting our water containers and other food containers so in the dishwasher. Heat. It's not just heat, no. it's freezing as well? Freezing, heat, friction, the, 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 you know, in a, in a dishwasher, the friction of the, of the rumbling of, the, of everything together. It can cause the, that those molecules that are all strung together, the epoxy molecules, can break off into the food at the, because they become weakened. Um, the other concern, of course, especially with high acid foods such as tomato sauces, you want to be concerned because the acid can, is more, um, is possibly going to leach the BPA out of that plastic lining in a way that's different from other food materials that are not as acidic. Well, the, the question then is, is this something that should be observed lifelong? I mean, I'm not having any more children. Um, is this something that I should look for or just tell my daughter to look about it for my grandchildren? Uh, making sure that she follows these suggestions that you just had. Well, I think I think it's important for everybody to be aware of of their what they're consuming. BPA um, is in a lot of different plastics, and just trying to use alternatives to to plastics. But definitely, for women who are um, uh, thinking about becoming pregnant or are pregnant or of fertile age, and and for children as well, because the the science is not. 100% there yet. We don't know everything yet. Um, to just be cautious um, and and be educated about what you're actually putting on the table and the the products that your <clears throat> the products that your food is touching. 
the you make it, it it's a very major problem when you start saying don't freeze it don't heat it to high temperatures don't put it in the dishwasher um so an example of a product that has a high like you know there are stratifications mm -hmm. so what is a one product you can think of that you can say even if now and then you do that don't use that is it putting it in the microwave again it it really would depend on what is being contained in the product um i for many reasons i don't recommend microwaving plastic because it can melt and plastic may not again bpa is a plastic hardener there are other chemicals that we know are associated with health outcomes that are in plastic such as phthalates which are a plastic softener so we don't know necessarily what's in the plastic i i would not rec i would definitely not recommend microwaving i just have to tell you i'm sorry i didn't bring it because i didn't know we would go in this direction but i had a little water bottle that had been in the car for a while and I put it, I washed it, then I put it in the microwave to finish sterilizing it, and it went from a bottle this size to a bottle that size. And I kept it, I keep it in the refrigerator to remind um, people not to put plastic in the microwave. So that's I'm a great idea. Yeah, I think, it, it think, I think we all should do that to remind people of how much chemical reaction goes on when you send it mm -hmm. to that high temperature. Yeah. So, do you, is there, you say there's not a point that we should stop being aware of it. But thinking about obesity in children, mm -hmm. there are definitely additional problems than the yes. problems of adults. Adults have been through the childhood phase and now they're adults and they can deal with the issues. What are some of the main issues that we're trying to avoid by keeping these children from being obese? Well, um, obesity at an early age can have problems later on in life, such as uh, cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes, um, arthritis, arthritis, definitely, I mean, because it's also an inflammatory situation when you when you have an obese um, individual. Um, so yes, there there are definitely considera concerns and considerations. And in terms of adult onset obesity versus child obesity, you know, you think it, and exposures, it, you're dealing with um, temporality. You're dealing with time. So it goes back to what I had said about developmental origins of disease. If uh, if you have a child who is starting out obese, then the question is what what caused that early on versus an adult where there are a lot more exposures that could have happened over time and it's, it's a little bit more difficult to yeah, suss out. you could out. have a job sitting at a desk and Right, not the sedentary around. lifestyle, exactly. What about the emotional aspects? And I know that, I know you're not a clinician, it doesn't matter, but we've all had people that we've known who have had morbid obesity or very obese and some not even that obese and have some emotional components to it well i i definitely think that um there there are concerns about uh, appearance when when especially for children and we know how stressful being a child is especially in new york city and as they become teenagers um and this is something that uh, the this particular birth cohort it's being looked at also are psychological outcomes but um but I know from the research that I was involved in with um, BPA and obesity, we had some missing data and that was sometimes because of refusals. They would not, they, especially with the waist circumference, they did not want the tape measure around the waist. So the, either a mom didn't or a, a child didn't. Um, and, and if they refuse, you can't age? do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it sounds like a lot of denial going on uh, with, with obesity um, and that only gets worse often as the obesity gets worse. So we want to make sure that the parents have something to take away. Mm -hmm. And in addition to the things that we've already discussed, so if you go to your clinician now, do you ask your clinician to check your child for a BPA? I, I would love, in my dream world, that would be a situation that could happen. Unfortunately, um, that sort of monitoring doesn't exist in the pediatric office, what, no matter who the clinician is. Um, but, but what should happen are those vital statistics of the height and the weight and all the other uh, healthy statistics that would be done in a clinician's office. And, and then the, that clinician can chart and, and help guide the parent for whether or not the child is on course, potentially 
uh, for obesity or being overweight or whether they're um, at, a, at something that is um, more um, average. Normal trajectory for, mm -hmm. for their weight. The, the, the thing is though, if a clinician does this, you could then go back and look at, um, do a retrospective and look at the record all along if they only had one sample. So I'm just <laughs> suggesting that since there are a lot more questions to answer, that um, we're in a situation where maybe we need to start cozying up with some clinicians I, who do pediatrics. That would again be my dream. Let's join environmental and occupational health science and the School of Public Health with the School of Medicine and and start a program for teaching uh, soon-to-be clinicians. Environmental with a pediatrician with the how to how look to for look environmental look triggers or precursors to precursors to disease. because we have an epidemic that's really going out of control and I don't know if you looked at this whether the use when plastics became um, everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're everywhere in everything. Mm -hmm. Whether there's any timeline that would suggest there is. There is. <laughs> um, so BPA, the, the the very very short history of BPA. Although BPA has been around for o over a hundred years now, uh, it was invented by a, a Russian chemist, and um, he named it after himself. But anyway, um, fast forward to the 1950s. And uh, two individual scientists, one at GE and one at Bayer, so GE in the United States and Bayer in Germany, working completely independently, discovered that BPA could be made into the plastic that we know today and the epoxy resin that we know today. And uh, just a couple of years after that, the mid to late 50s, BPA production started to explode. Today, m I'm afraid to quote the number, I think I'm searching my memory, four million tons of BPA annually are produced, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. It's, it's a major industry. It's ubiquitous. It's ubiquitous. And so it's mm -hmm. our responsibility, as you were talking about the parents, to look for what they can do to keep their children from doing it. I, I'm, I'm not so sure that people in certain generations will do it. Um, it's well, so convenient to open a can. Sure. But Certainly for the parents, we want to be sure that they're looking at it. And for women who are childbearing age. Yes, yes. Should a, you know when you do prenatal, I know you're not a clinician, but I'm just asking in terms of the environmental and the clinical, making it translate to useful um, information. So when a woman is preparing to have a child mm -hmm. and we tell them to get their MMR titers mm -hmm. to make sure they have them and to do all that, should they do a BPA urine level? Again, this is the sort of uh, chemical analysis that you need a specialized lab. Um, okay. So, so yes, I, I would love if that could happen. Um, we, in this study and, and many studies that are involved in the United States, send their samples to, often send their samples to the CDC, where they have uh, standardization and, and it's accepted because uh, across research studies, you can compare results and say yes. it was done the same way. Um, so, so we're not there yet, but maybe one day, it could happen. Well, it is very important for us to make sure, so we've talked about the parents and protecting their children, and we've talked about whether it's a big worry or not. It's a concern. It's a concern. It's definitely a but concern. It's, it's an easy concern, especially for things that are marked on the bottom. Look for a number three or a number seven, and it most likely has BPA in it. If there's a number three or a number seven yes. on the bottom of the can, or plastic or container. plastic it most likely has BPA well we can all do that uh, the so question is is there lots of strings of numbers is this a number that stands out usually by itself yes it would be in a triangle number three means PVC which is a plastic or a vinyl a polyvinyl which is normally made with phthalates but may could be containing BPA it depends on the manufacturer uh, number seven is a catch-all number it's actually unknown what goes into number seven, but BPA, if it, something is known to be made with BPA, it'll wind up in number se as a number seven. So number three is, we can, doesn't have BPA. It, do, it, it, it may have it BPA. It may have BPA. It's number likely. seven? So if you have a three or a seven, don't give don't it to the it. kids. Don't use it. Don't, don't buy it. Don't use it. Don't buy it. 
I want to thank you very much for being here, Dr. Thank Hefner. You. It's very informative. We have to try, us in the School of Public Health, to not wait until a disease happens. We try and prevent it. Yes. And thank you very much for your discussion of obesity and BPA. Thank you. This is all for today. We hope you will join us next time here at Health Center.